God, in His grace, has blessed every believer with every spiritual blessing. In Him, we were chosen before the foundation of the world. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. In Him, we have obtained an inheritance. And in Him, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. God desires to see every believer realize our hope and our inheritance in Christ. That God's children realize the magnitude of Christ's power and glory. This is the kind of church that we should be. A, a church, church built, built on biblical, biblical bedrock. bedrock. Our Sunday sermon series on the book of Ephesians. Um, all right, there you go. Good morning, brothers and sisters in the Lord. And of course, another pleasant greeting to our worshipers online who may be in different time zones. As you know, we're going through a series in the book of Ephesians called Built on Biblical Bedrock, the church that pleases God. You don't want to be part of a church that does not please God. And we're trying by the grace of God to be one of those. So this morning, we just read together Ephesians 5, 18 to 21, and this talks about being filled with the right spirit, being filled with the right spirit. Is there such a thing as being filled with the wrong spirit? Absolutely. I'm sure you have been listening to both international and local news lately, because lately, both our local newspapers and then even our local website versions of those, and even international news has been filled not with the Ukraine uh, invasion, but with what happened last Tuesday at Uvalde, Texas, when 18-year-old Salvador Ramos entered Robb Elementary School with two guns and hundreds of rounds of ammunition and started killing grade two to grade four students. Killed 19 of them, wounded 17 of them, killed two of the teachers. And as I was just reflecting on this, it, it's just mind boggling. It, it just defies imagination. What did grade two to grade four students do to this guy? Of course, the answer is nothing. They've never done anything to him. They don't even know him from Adam. It makes you realize, friends, that there are such things happening all over the world, in our nation, in our homes, that are being driven by the wrong forces, the wrong spirits. Now, I'm mentioning this for you, friends, because you must be asking yourself, why? Was he demon-possessed? Was he on drugs? Did he have a mental illness? Was he drunk? A combination of those? We'll never know, perhaps. But did you know that as Christians, the only difference we have from Salvador Ramos is what drove him and what drives you and me today? We all have different things driving us, friends, but something drove him to be evil. What is driving you not to be evil? How can you keep from becoming like him? The answer, we must be filled with the right spirit, God's spirit. Friends, if not for God's spirit, we'll be no different. So I want to give you a very important note, which begins our outline today. Without Ephesians 5, 18, all the commands in Ephesians before and after this verse are temptations to legalism. And I mean that. Ephesians 5, 18 is a very important verse in the whole book of Ephesians because there are commands before that, there are commands after that, there are temptations for you and me to be legalistic, which is to do things in our power, driven by wrong motives, if we do not have the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But when God's Spirit fills a Christian, you know what? Everything falls in place. Because it says in Philippians 2.13, it is God who works in you, both to will. 
to make us will what is right, and to work to make us do what is right according to his good pleasure. So if love is the cure to legalism, God's spirit is the source of that love. Galatians 5, 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love. We must be filled with the right spirit. Not because we're afraid to become Salvadoramos, but because if you're a Christian and if you're genuinely saved, Christianity can be very frustrating. If we try to do it in our own strength, we must be filled with the right spirit. Let's begin in a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for this day that you've gathered us on site and online to worship you together this time in your word. Father, as always, I pray that this will not be an intellectual exercise, purely academic in nature, filling minds with information, God forbid, Father, transform us, we pray, by renewing our minds through your word, by the power of your Holy Spirit. May this be true for all of us and myself included. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. In our passage today, did you notice how it begins? Do not be drunk with wine. Some Bible scholars theorize that no different from us today, from 21st century Christianity. There were people who probably got saved from the debauchery that used to be part of their Ephesian culture. Do you remember what we talked about when we talk, uh, talked about Ephesians? Ephesus was the center of sexual prostitution. The temple of Diana or Artemis was the center for sexual prostitution. It brought a lot of commerce and tourists into that city purely for that. And Christians were saved from that, but maybe part of the debauchery they used to do was perhaps getting drunk, which is really part of a lot of rituals in pagan rituals. So now Paul used that common problem of getting drunk to illustrate how important it is for you and I to be filled with the right spirit. And then like any good teacher, I'm referring to God, not to Paul, because God simply inspired Paul to write. God, after telling us this is the right thing to do, he now inspires us what to do and why we should do it. So let's look at the Word of God together. And before we begin, I'd like to summarize the entire message in this way. Let's be filled with God's Spirit, or we'll be driven by the wrong ones. Let's be filled with God's Spirit, or we'll be driven by the wrong ones. One of them is already in our passage, the spirit of alcohol. Another spirit is a living entity, demonic spirit. Another spirit is our old nature. It may not be exactly the same as God's spirit, but it's still a powerful force. It could be the spirit of drugs, the spirit of something else. But let's be filled with God's spirit or we'll be driven by the wrong one. Let's look at verse 18, friend. Look at what it says. And do not get drunk with wine. The word drunk there is the word methusko. Methusko means to be changed. In behavior, we normally call that intoxicated, and there are various levels of intoxication. Uh, in fact, if we were as advanced as having breathalyzers, you know, to analyze how much alcohol is there in your breath, there are what you call acceptable blood alcohol limits. We'll, we'll not go there. This is not about that. This is about how wine or alcohol changes us. Do not get drunk with wine. Do not be changed in your behavior, your personality with wine, for that is debauchery. And then he goes to a command which I will deal with later, be filled with the Spirit. So negatively, avoid being drunk. That's one of the wrong spirits mentioned because of its consequences, which is debauchery, which is simply being totally out of control. Now, I was really tempted, friend, may I be honest with you, to go over this very quickly because it's mentioned very quickly. But because, you know, having taught Sunday school for a long time as an elder, uh, counseled young people, including my own at home, I, I don't want to uh, waste this opportunity to have some instruction for us with regards to Christians and alcohol, okay? So may we show this slide on the screen. I would just like us to be very clear that there is not a single command in the Bible that says, do not touch alcohol. I've been looking for it for years. It's not there. 
And that's why I'd like to be very clear about this because we're not going to please everybody the way we will tackle this today. I'm anticipating that. So let me just give four guiding principles about the Christian and alcohol. Number one, if you can't handle it, don't even start. What do you mean, Pastor, if I cannot handle it? If taking alcohol changes you in any negative way or leads to negative outcomes, don't even start. Now, Pastor, I can handle it. Really? And I was just reading uh, a few weeks ago about some young lady, you know, she, she was a believer. She was saying, I, I, I think I said yes to him too quickly. And I was having second thoughts, but I think it was because I took two glasses of red wine. <laughs> Negative consequences. She wasn't drunk, she wasn't even tipsy, but because wine made you more talkative than you are. You know, alcohol, friends, is a depressant. It inhibits your normal uh, defenses. It suppresses them. It lowers your caution. So you could actually tell the whole, I'm not drunk. Look at me. Am I drunk? I can drive. If you give me a breathalyzer test, my blood level of alcohol will be below the level needed to be arrested. All right. But if your behavior changes and you begin to be more talkative than you usually are, that might lead to negative consequences. Are you following me, friends? So whether you're an old person, a young person, you're one of the youth, if you take alcohol and it changes your behavior in any negative way or leads to negative consequences, don't. Don't even start. Number two, if you can't guarantee that nobody misunderstands you or stumbles because of you, don't do it in public. Uh, Where is that principle found, Pastor? 1 Corinthians 8 to 10. Those are three chapters where Paul talked about meat offered to idols. And Paul said, there is nothing wrong with eating meat. Uh, I really, I'm really glad he said that. Because <laughs> I love to eat meat. But he said, if somebody offered meat to idols, and they know somebody who has a weaker uh, conscience or is younger in the faith sees you, and you're eating it, not caring about any consequences, he said, you're not acting in love. 1 Corinthians chapters 8 to 10 talk about Love, my love for others as a Christian, limits my liberty. Nothing wrong with eating meat. But if eating meat makes another person stumble, Paul said, then I will refuse to eat meat offered to idols for, out of love for that person. So friends, if you can't guarantee that nobody misunderstands you or stumbles because of you, then don't do it in public. Now, even in private, see number one above. Number one is really the number one principle because that's extracted directly from Ephesians 5, 18. If you can't handle it, don't even start. Now, number three is related to number two. If you are a church leader, remember the principle of escalation. Um, I'm saying this even though there are very few church leaders in comparison, but it's important. You see, as for our pastors who report to me, I prefer, I recommend, I request them to be teetotalers. You know why? Because of this principle. What is the principle of the escalation, pastor? If I'm a, an elder or a pastor, why should this matter? This is the principle of the escalation. It happens in public. If you see me finishing two cans of beer, you know, somewhere in public, you might be tempted to say, He's my senior pastor. If he can finish two cans of beer in public, what keeps me from finishing a bottle of wine? Because he's supposed to be better than me, right? He's my spiritual leader. He's our senior pastor. Escalation. Because he's supposed to be my spiritual leader, if my senior pastor finishes two cans of beer, why can I not finish half a bottle of red wine? Escalation. Now you see me finishing half a bottle of red wine in public, you know, enjoying it with medium rare steak. Are you hungry now? <laughs> you say, oh, pastor, I just saw you finish half a bottle of red wine. That's about three glasses or so. That means, pastor, I can finish half a bottle of vodka, hard liquor. Escalation. Then... You see me in public, and I'm happily drinking my scotch whiskey, single malt. You know, <laughs> some of you are smiling, you know what I'm talking about. 
and then uh, on the rocks. And you see me finish several shots of it. You say, oh, pastor, you finished three shots of single malt scotch whiskey. I can finish a whole bottle. You're following me, my friends. The principal escalation for church leaders is if my spiritual leader does it, he's supposed to be holier than me, leading me by example, then I can do something a little bit more. That comes under the biblical principle of higher responsibility and accountability for church leaders. It's something that comes with the territory. If you're a pastor and elder listening to me, even on site or online, like it or not, that's true. And uh, you can debate with me all you want. I will not debate with you, especially if you're from another church. But that's a fact of life. If it's okay with my pastor, I can escalate a little bit. Number four, this is perhaps very important. Don't be judgmental towards those who don't, as well as to those who do. We who are perhaps a little bit more open to this, we sometimes have a tendency to, to condemn our fundamentalist brothers and sisters. We look at them and say, you're very legalistic, you know what? You're very uptight. Uh, you're all teetotalers. You're actually all hypocrites. We're tempted to think like that, right? You're all self-righteous. That's not true. That's not fair. Some of them are the kindest, most sincere people I know. Our fundamentalist brethren. But neither should anyone else condemn those who do take alcohol, provided you meet this guideline. How does this apply? Okay. You ask me to do your weddings, okay? And when I do your weddings, sometimes I am seated at the, you know, the table. And then, of course, every reception will have a toast of wine. And it's a strong possibility some of you will be sitting across the senior pastor, no? And so, here's the toast. And some of you are saying, wow, I love this red wine. Why in the world do I have to sit across Pastor Larry? In all the reception, why are we at the same table? Friends, go ahead. Take that toast. If you can handle it, if taking a sip will not make you look for the waiter and say, waiter, give me the whole bottle. If you can keep yourself from doing that and just take the toast, please go ahead and take it. Don't ask God how, why he's so unfair that you're seated across the senior pastor, okay? It's fine. It's fine. If you can handle it, go ahead and take it. But let, be, let us all be guided by these things. If you can handle it, you can go ahead. But if you cannot, don't start. If you can guarantee that nobody will stumble, don't do it in public. And then in private, see number one. If you're a church leader, remember escalation. And don't be judgmental towards those who don't as well as to those who do. I hope this is clear for our young people, our young adults, and our old people like me. Let's be kind to each other on this. Let's not be legalistic, but let's not be also lax about this because our testimony is at stake. Positively now, positively, the command is to be filled with God's Spirit. Now, I, I have a confession to give you. When we take this up, I'm going to dwell at length on those words. We're going to look at a doctrine today and use this, these words, be filled with the Spirit, as a launching pad to take up the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So I'm sorry, but it will take a little time. I hope you're patient with me. First, it is a continuous command. The word here, be filled, is actually one word in Greek based on the root word pleiroo. Play raw of friends means keep being filled. That the verb tense here is active, it's present, and it starts in the present, it continues till the future. It's not a one-time thing, it's a continuous thing. Keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. And I remember our passage in Ephesians 5.1 which says, Be imitators of God as beloved children. Now, can I really be an imitator of God when it comes to loving people? The answer is only if I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. Can I not love people on my own strength? You can try. You'll probably fail. God did not design us to run on our own. Once we are saved, we got to be filled with the Spirit, or we will find the Bible a depressing list of commands we cannot do. 
We've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Or you will just find this very, very depressing or intimidating or both. So Jesus referred to being filled with the Spirit when he said in John 15, 5, Whoever abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, he said, you can do nothing. That's a reference to the presence of the Holy Spirit in us. If we do not obey this command, we cannot obey any other. That's how important it is to be filled with the Spirit. If I do not obey being filled with the Spirit, and I have a role and you have a role, all other commands in the Bible are hard to do or impossible to do. Uh, why? Because we cannot do God's will without God's Spirit. And Dr. John MacArthur in his commentary in Ephesians said this, and for a while I was sort of reacting to it. I said, is he right? Did he say this right? He said, second only to the command for the unsaved to trust in Christ for salvation, there is no command more necessary in the Bible than this. That's what he said. You know, for a while I struggled with that. I said, wasn't he exaggerating a bit? Second, only to the command for the unsaved to turn to Christ for salvation, there is no other command more important than this. Because I was remembering the great commandment, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. But as I was reflecting on what he said, I realized he was spot on. He was right. Can you really love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength? without the Spirit inside you, without asking God's help? Can I really love my wife as Christ loved himself, as Christ loved the church, I mean, and gave himself up for it? Can I love my neighbor as myself without God's Spirit? The answer is no. So he was right. After the command to trust in Christ for salvation, friends, there is no command more necessary in the Bible than be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because we cannot even love God or others without it. Not only is it a continuous command, it's a choice. We have the option to not be filled with the Holy Spirit, but that's to our loss. So we can actually resist God's Spirit in deliberate disobedience. But unless we're filled with the Spirit, you know what? You will live in spiritual weakness, frustration, and defeat. You'll be a defeated Christian. You'll find the Christian life something that's either boring or something that is completely frustrating or both without the filling of the Holy Spirit. And before I finally go to that part where we talk about how, I just want you to remember three pictures about the filling of the Holy Spirit because it will help you remember and also apply it. I want you to think of a sailboat driven by the wind. Then I want you to think about meat that you marinate overnight in salt to give it flavor, and then a man out of control from anger. They're all pictures of the word pleiro'o, which means to keep being filled with the Spirit. Have you ever seen a sailboat driven by the wind? Uh, in the 1800s, 1700s, they were the main mode of transportation. And the boats, they were massive, big structures. And yet, they would be driven by sails. How did that happen? Because the wind would fill the sails, and then the wind would drive that massive structure reaching hundreds, thousands of miles across the ocean. That's a picture of being filled by the Spirit. When we're filled with the Spirit, He actually drives our life and moves us, just like the men who wrote the Old Testament were moved by the Holy Spirit in 2 Peter 1. 21, a sailboat driven by the wind. Number two, have you ever soaked or marinated meat overnight in your refrigerator? You know, you put salt, vinegar, uh, soy sauce, and you dip it there eight hours because the following day you're going to make delicious barbecue. Uh, what happens when you soak the, the meat in salt, in brine? It permeates every part of the meat, right? It saturates it. That's a picture again of pleiro'o. We are saturated by the Holy Spirit so that every part of our being, 
That's our mind, our will, our emotions, our feelings are controlled by the Holy Spirit. And last but not least, a sailboat, meat, a man out of control from anger. This is used the same way in such situations, play ro'o. The person who is filled with anger is no longer under his own control. Have you ever seen a case of road rage? Well, I have. It's scary. When road rage happens, a person no longer thinks about consequences, and he might turn his car into a weapon. You know, running after another uh, car and, you know, blocking it, honking the horn, challenging the person to go down, it's scary. That's a person under control by anger. It's the same idea in Pleiro'o. You're so controlled by the Spirit, you're no longer who you used to be in a positive sense now. But I just gave you a picture of road rage for you to remember it. That's how God wants us to be so dominated, controlled by the Spirit. Instead of road rage, we have instead the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now let's go to the golden question. Pastor, I've got a good picture. I want to go there. How? How can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, friend, that's found in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, and then singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Friends, to be filled with the Holy Spirit involves two things. One is an action. You saw that in Colossians 3.16. It's to fill yourself so much with the Word of God that your reactions, your actions, your speech, your decisions, your emotions are all governed by the Bible. Now, I've been asked this question. How about uh, the spontaneous reactions, Pastor? Can the Bible govern those? Like, I'll give you a very common example. When I'm driving in traffic, and here comes this, this motorcycle that suddenly darts in front of me, and I have to avoid him, and I crash into the, the curb. How do I not release words that cannot be printed, Pastor? How can the Holy Spirit control me during times like that? Friends, you've got to believe this. If, if the Holy Spirit is in our hearts, and the Word of God fills our heart, it may take time, but you'll get there. you reach the point where, oh, he cut me off. Oh, I bump against the curb. I wonder how my, uh, my wheels are doing. But you know what? I'm not going to run after you and commit murder. Because the Bible says, thou shalt not kill. I will just stay here. Calm myself and start driving again. You will get there, friends. Even our spontaneous, reflex, knee-jerk reactions can be governed by the Holy Spirit when our minds are filled with the Word of God. That's the action we do. We let the Word of Christ dwell richly in us. What is the attitude? The attitude is found in Romans 12.1. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. The word present here is similar to pleiro'o. It's a continuous, day-to-day, moment-by-moment, surrendering and presenting ourselves. Friends, let's make this very practical. When you begin your day, when you start your day, realizing that Romans 12, 1, the attitude means we should keep doing that, surrendering ourselves to God. Begin your day by telling the Lord, Father, whatever happens today, I surrender myself to you. I will begin this day surrendered to you, committed to you. Let's walk through this day together. Friends, when you begin with that right attitude and then you supplement that with the action of filling yourself with the Word of God, you will be filled with God's Spirit. It may not happen overnight, but God will change you more and more into the image of Christ. What is the alternative? You know what the alternative is? I'll fight with the Holy Spirit. I'll refuse, or maybe I don't need to. I'll just refuse to do the action of filling myself with the Word of God. You know what the danger of this is? If I do not fill myself with the Word of God, or even if I do, but I choose what to follow, there are only two resources inside us. One is the Holy Spirit of God. You know what the other resource remaining is? Our old nature. 
In Galatians 5, 19 to 21, Paul mentioned this old nature present still in every Christian, he said. He called it the flesh. The works of the flesh are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. What am I trying to say? If we are not filled with God's Word and Spirit, the other resource we have in our hearts is our old nature. It's either or. And when we turn to our old nature, we can be as bad as we used to be or worse. I'm just laying it down for us, friend, to tell us this is how important it is to be filled with God's Word and God's Spirit. There is no other resource. It's either or. Either I'm controlled by God's Word and Spirit, or I will be listening to my old nature and then all these gross sins will be part of my life again. And that's why sometimes even long-standing Christians, they fall into sin. Because there comes a point when they begin to be selective about what they will apply here or they simply stop reading the Word of God or simply tell the Holy Spirit, not that, not that one, I'm not going to do that. They fall into sin. But you know what the beautiful thing is about being a, a, being a Christian is? A genuine believer will repent. And the beautiful thing about being in a genuinely loving Christian family is the church should come alongside and say, we forgive you. Come back. We're here not to shoot our wounded. We're here to help our wounded because we're a spiritual hospital. Come back. Let's do this together. Let's restore you to ministry, and to fellowship. That, friends, is how you can be filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, to sum it up, the action, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. The attitude, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, a daily moment-by-moment -moment surrender and submission to God's Spirit that is completely within our control and not choosing to wrestle with God. Choosing to listen to Him. When He brings Bible verses to our mind, to take those seriously and to obey accordingly. Now, what are the consequences of being filled with God's Spirit? Now, here's the nice part. We just learned that we can be filled with the wrong spirit negatively, but we can be filled with the right spirit positively. We now know how. Filling with the Word and the attitude of surrender to the Lord day by day, moment by moment. What are the consequences, the blessings? These are what happens to those who are filled with God's Spirit. First, singing to God and one another, because that's what our passage says. In other words, Christ, church music, friends, is a means of Christians ministering to each other and worshiping God. Now, let's look at that both ways. First, singing as public worship. You can bless other people, and Paul said you can do it to psalms, that's the Old Testament psalms, set to music, hymns, that's what we usually sing on Saturday night, every 5.30, our traditional service is all hymns, and spiritual songs, the songs we just sang a while ago. It's a general category for all God-honoring, Bible-centered songs. And in public worship, please get this. In public worship, what you sing with sincerity always blesses others. Here's something I'd like to happen next Sunday. Next Sunday, when the song leader asks us to rise and we sing, and I also include you are on, on, online, when we sing, sing it with all your heart. Because that's what Paul said. Look at what he said. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. He's talking about blessing other people. Did you know that just by showing up today, you've already blessed people? Did you know that? So when you stood up to sing, maybe there was someone at the back saying, should I ever go to church again? Maybe this is the last time my, my, my body will ever be in a church again because I don't know if I want to keep believing God. And then they see you. You're standing there. They say, if they took the time to take a bath, dress properly, 
ride a bus, a jeepney, a taxi, or drive a car and go here. Maybe there is something to this worship. And then they saw you sing. And then you were singing with sincerity. It shows in your face. It's there in your voice. And by the way, you can even be out of tune. It's fine. But in your body language, they saw the sincerity. Well, guess what? Somebody looking at you will say, that woman there, that man there, he blesses me because he sings from his heart. That's what Paul is talking about here. Your presence. And then the lyrics of the songs themselves. That's why Pastor Miggs, our worship pastor, is so careful about the lyrics of our song. Your emotions shown in your face, your body language, and your voice. And then the music itself positively intensifies the lyrics and your emotions. And you become a blessing to other people in public worship. So, next Sunday. When we gather again here, please sing with all your heart. Do it for God, but now that you know, do it for the people looking at you. Because you are a blessing to other people. My wife just told me last night, and I gave the same sermon. One of the attenders there has been going through an extremely, extremely difficult time spiritually. Told my wife, I was blessed. To be reminded that I am a blessing. Wow. To hear that from her. And knowing personally that she's been through what I'd call a living hell. And to say, I am glad to know I can be a blessing. That just blows me away. Because friends, you really can be a blessing. Next Sunday, let's do that again. In fact, after this sermon, we will sing again. Let's sing it with sincerity. Because you can bless others with your singing in public worship. And we can also sing as personal worship. Look at the words of Paul again. He said, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. What does it mean? Well, I can exalt God by singing in public or by simply singing to Him in my heart. Isn't that beautiful? You know, sometimes we're afraid of singing because the people beside me might realize I cannot hold a tune. If that's true, please sing, but sing softer, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Go ahead and sing. But when we sing to the Lord, He doesn't care if we're out of tune. He just looks at you and says, are you really singing that song for me? It's from your heart? He's honored. He's honored. When you sing to God personally, and what you sing to God personally is as honoring to God as any sacrifice you can give. Did you know that Christianity is a singing faith? It's a singing faith. You've got 150 psalms there that are all set to music poss possibly. I hope you never doubt that, but Christianity is a singing faith. If you doubt that, then read your passage again. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Christianity is a singing faith. And what you sing to God personally can be as honoring to God as any sacrifice you can give. Practical application. If you, like many people today, because we are now going back on site in the office, in school, if you are caught in traffic, will you make sure there's some Christian music in your, uh, I don't know, stereo, your uh, Spotify, whatever you use. Just, just make sure there's some of it. Nothing wrong with love song. Go ahead. Uh, if you're a K-pop lover, go ahead. I, I see nothing in the Bible that says it's sinful, okay? But will you please add some Christian songs? You know why? So that you can sing and make melody in your heart to the audience of one. And he'll be pleased with you. Number two, singing is one characteristic of spiritual Christians. Thanksgiving to God is another. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 Give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Here's another one. If you're taking notes, please write this down. Psalm 50.23 The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. Isn't that beautiful? We sometimes think, I think I got to give a very, very big offering to God. 
There's nothing wrong with that. I think I must offer my time, my, my, my talent to God. Nothing wrong with that. Go ahead. But did you know if you offer thanksgiving to God, he says, he who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. Don't miss out on this one. And third, submitting to one another. Paul said, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. What does this mean? Willingly serving others rather than dominating them and exalting ourselves. And this is only possible when we have reverence for Christ. What does it mean that I have reverence for Christ? Remember Jesus? When He was on earth, He was God the Son. He was always God the Son. Before He came to earth, He was God the Son. He never stepped down in position. He simply added human flesh to himself. John 1.1 1, 1 reminds us that by him everything in the universe was created, but remember the creator of the universe. When his apostles were arguing who's the greatest among us, remember what he did. God the Son wiped the feet of his arguing apostles. That combination, friends, of deity and humility should inspire awe and reverence and worship in our hearts for our Lord Jesus Christ, who being in very nature God, took on himself human flesh and went all the way to Calvary and died an ignoble death, even there on a cross. And when we reflect on this, it develops reverence for us that God the Son, in all His supremacy and sovereignty and glory and majesty, would be so humble. And this leads us to reverence, and we become like Him, a willing servant of others. I'll close with this, friends. Be filled with God's Spirit, or you'll be driven by the wrong one. Be filled with God's Spirit, or there are other spirits that can drive you. The spirit of alcohol, the spirit of our old sinful nature. Demonic spirits cannot possess us, but they can influence us. Drugs and other things can run us. Be filled with God's Spirit, or you'll be driven by the wrong ones. And when we are filled with the Spirit, the first to be blessed are our families, our biological, physical families, and spiritual family called the church. So here's where I'd like to close. I don't need to remind you of this. We're living in very evil, discouraging times. You know, some of us are discouraged because of our political situation. Some of us because of our economic situation as a country. Some of us because we've lost jobs during the lockdown. Some of us have lost ministries during the lockdown. Some of us have lost friends because of the pandemic. They died, or relatives, or loved ones. These are evil, discouraging times, and the world outside there is so depressing. Do you realize that our passage also guides us about how we treat each other inside this church? Look at it. Look at verses 18 to 21. These are good guidelines as to how we behave inside the church towards each other. Filled with the Spirit, addressing one another, making melody to the Lord, submitting to one another. In God's family, we lift each other up, not tear each other down. When we are singing, thanksgiving, and submitting, we lift each other up. So what are you known for? in your physical family, in this church family? Are you an encourager or are you a demoralizer? Are you the one who lifts others up or are you the one who tears others down? Are you the one who heals other people or are you the one who destroys other people? God forbid. When you're filled with God's Spirit, you're a singing person, you're a thanking person, you're a submitting person. You have no other effect on other people except to bless them. That's why Galatians 6, 9 to 10 encourages us, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Did you get that? Let us do good to everyone especially 
to those who are of the household of faith. Let's be like this to each other, okay? Be filled with the Spirit, singing, thanksgiving, and submitting to one another. Father, we thank you for how your word makes Christianity a joy to live out. It is not a frustrating, draining adventure. But it is a journey where we can see what work in our lives, changing us more into the image of Christ. And Father, may this church family here be people who are rooting for each other, who are lifting each other up, who never try to tear each other down, who find ways and means to encourage those who are fallen and discouraged. And I just pray, Lord, that this happens because the world outside, Lord, just drains us so much. It depresses us so badly. So may this place here called the church family be an oasis of rest, be a time where God's people can affirm each other. Because that's how you designed the church to be. Enable us by your grace to become like this. For we ask this all through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen.